Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is worthy to be praised. He is a faithful God. I want to receive all of you from all our viewing centers, from all your homes, and as many who are joining us right now. It's going to be a great service this evening. I want us to just take a few minutes to appreciate God for his faithfulness, for his love, for his mercies that endures forever. Lift your voice where you are and just begin to magnify the name of Jesus. The Lord is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be glorified. He is worthy to be exalted. Father, we give you the praise. Father, we give you the glory. Father, we give you the honor. We bow before you, our King. We reverence you, our God, the one who rules, the one who reigns, the one who is mighty, mighty to save, mighty to deliver, mighty to rescue. We worship you today. Come on, just lift your voice and bless his name right there in your homes right there in the viewing centers right there across the nations of the world lift your voice in appreciation and glorify God and magnify God and lift him high tell him how much he means to you he is the great I am he is the mighty God. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. The beginning and the end. He starts a thing and finishes it. He is not a God of abandoned projects. He walks in ways we cannot see. Oh yes indeed. He walks in ways that are beyond our imaginations. He walks in ways we cannot see. Lift him high where you are. Give him praise where you are. Estall him on high. You are worthy, our God. You are faithful, our King. You are mighty, Jehovah. Ragata balatusa, rekoto balade balakata, eshara kotofia, reboto sabrate kapalima, en shakada gozi breketoa, rekoto barade klutu peliata. We worship him now, we praise him now, we magnify him now, we glorify him now. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy El Shaddai. Shagotomanaya Repeteli Brakataya Rekoto Barade Clotosia Shate Kalabaroto Viate Beledia. Somebody give him praise, give him glory, tell him how much he means to you. Worship him tonight. E Kalabrosa Brade Katabalatabaya E Yateva Zuperedosiata. My God, I honor you. My God. God, I give you thanks. My God, I give you worship. Now begin to pray and ask the Lord to reach out to you tonight. Say, oh God, visit me upon this altar tonight. The altar of your word. The altar of truth. Let the entrance of your word give life to me today. Let it give change to me. Let it bring my transformation. Let it bring my deliverance. Let the entrance of your word transform my life. Make me whole again by the power of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we bless your holy name. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for gathering us in our different locations. And for connecting us right now to this service. Lord, speak your word to us and enrich us by the truth that comes from your word. In Jesus' most precious name. And everyone say, Amen and Amen. Praise God. I welcome all of you from all the centers tonight. And we're going to take some time to just worship the Lord together before we begin the lesson 
the teaching of this evening. I want you to connect with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your spirit. And God will be doing a new thing in the name of Jesus. We worship you, O oh God. We worship you, O oh God. Now is the time to lift him up. He is the God that is above all other gods. Uh -huh. He does wonders that is beyond comprehension. That's why we're going to lift up our hands this morning to the heavens and lift him up above every other God. Every God that has spoken against your life will be crumbled this morning because the main mighty God is in this place. Hallelujah. 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 Oh God, we worship you. We pray.
Hallelujah. We lay our crowns to worship him. He's a good God. What a mighty God we serve. Praise him forevermore. Praise him for his mighty power. Praise him for his mighty art. We exhort his holy name. He is worthy of praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Please take your seat in the presence of the Lord. And it is my joy to welcome you again to tonight's liberation service. I am sure that God will reach you where you are in a very special way. And your life will never be the same in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to please share the broadcast of this evening so you can we can reach more people with the good news of God's word that is coming tonight as we continue our studies in the book of Acts. Today we look at Paul shares the gospel with the Jews in Rome. Paul shares the gospel with the Jews in Rome and that's in Acts chapter 28 from verse 20 to verse 23. Paul shares the gospel with the Jews in Rome. And um, the discussion would be from Acts 28, verse 20 to 23. But before we go into that, I want to just begin with our introduction, uh, which says, Good evening, brethren, and welcome to tonight's liberation service. What a season we are in and an understanding that favor has a set time just as the Lord spoke to us on Sunday must stir up our spiritual sensitivity to ensure we do not miss our time of favor. I think that one of the things that that message that God brought to us on the set time of favor stirs up in our hearts, in our spirits, in our souls is, you know, the consciousness to, you know, even just to seek God to know that, oh God, I don't want to miss my set time of favor. If I've missed some previously, help me now to be more sensitive so that I never miss a set time of favor again. And I pray that God will honor that desire in the heart of as many who have that in the name of Jesus Christ. There is nothing more important in a man's life than to align yourself with God's timing for you. Nothing is more important than ensuring that your life aligns with God's timing for you. We have our own programs and our own agendas as human beings. But no matter what our agendas are, what our plans are, it is better when we are in God's plans. It is better when we are in God's timing. We may want to do certain things tomorrow. God may want them done today. It is better we get them done today. We may want to do some things today and God may want them done tomorrow. It is better we have them done tomorrow. God's timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. Because in his time, he makes all things beautiful. And I pray that your life will begin to align with God's time. You will not be a step too fast or a step too slow. You will just be in the perfect timing of God for your life. So shall it be in the name of Jesus Christ. I've said that it is there. It is in the perfect timing of God. There lies your blessings. There lies your liftings. The lifting of a man's life is tied to the perfect timings of God. And I pray that God will honor that in your life because you are the favored one. You are the favored one. 
So, don't waste it, but maximize it for your lifting. Don't waste it, maximize it for your lifting. One of the ways we can ensure that we do not waste our set time of favor is by walking in obedience. Walking in what? Obedience. Obedience is a very key thing. Why is it key? You know, the first sin that man committed was the sin of disobedience. The sin of disobedience. And obedience is still a big struggle for mankind till today. God in that garden said, you know, don't eat of this tree. And man disobeyed God. So the first sin on earth was disobedience. It was disobedient. In fact, it is the, that is the sin that gave birth to every other sin. It's like the, the grandparent of all sins. Disobedience. Disobedience. And obeying is a big thing for humankind. Obeying, especially obeying the word or the voice of God. And just doing it. Because sometimes, if we are true, honest with ourselves, obeying is not convenient. It's not convenient. Sometimes it's not convenient. So because of that, some people find it difficult. But if we align ourselves with obedience, then we will always be in God's timing. And the things he has for us will come true for us. So I've said obedience is key to harnessing your set time of favor. And we must all pray that the Lord increases our obedience level. Increases what? Our obedience level. If we obey more, we will achieve more. If we obey more, we will do what? We will achieve more. If we obey more, we will achieve more. Let's read Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. It's where the scripture talks about if you are willing and obedient. He said, if you are willing and what? And obedient. What will happen? You shall eat the good of the land. Verse 20 says, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. He said, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So if we obey more, we will achieve more. The good of the land is available for us when we obey. My prayer is that your obedience level will increase today in the name of Jesus Christ. So we're going to read our test in Acts chapter 28, verse 20 to 23 is where we'll be studying today. And it says... For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you. Remember, this is Paul now. And the Jews in Rome have gathered to him. So he's the one addressing them. He says, for this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you. He said, because for the hope of Israel, I am what? Bound with this chain. Take note of those words. He said, then they said to him, we neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. So basically they are saying to him, look, we have not heard anything about you, no report about you, or on any negative report about you. But, in verse 22, but we desire to hear from you what you think for concerning this sect. Yeah? We know that it is spoken against everywhere. So, we have not heard anything about you negative. But we have heard something about Christianity, which they refer to as what? As a sect. Okay. Verse 23. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him 
at his lodging. Yeah? To whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Interesting. Very, very interesting. We are going to discuss this passage tonight under two subheadings. The first one being the Jewish leaders in Rome have no negative report about Paul. They have no what? Negative report about Paul. And that in itself is amazing because, you know, in most places that Paul went to before he got there, there was probably one negative news or the other. But it is not surprising that they have no negative report about Paul because if you have been following us in these teachings, you will find out that the people that cause problem, the Jews that cause problems for Paul in the cities where problems were caused for him. In some cases, were Jews who came from other towns that he has been to before. I don't know if any of you remember. For example, the, the ones that actually started this problem that got him into prison were Jews who came from other uh, places where he has ministered, who saw him in Jerusalem. They came for, was it Passover? Like he came. And then they saw him. They then stirred up, you know, the, the others. Now, those troublemakers were not necessarily, they had not arrived to Rome. So, these Jews there, say, well, we have not heard anything negative about you. But we have heard about uh, the sect. Yeah? All right. So, as we discussed last week, in Paul's meeting with the leaders of the Jews in Rome, his aim was to give them his own account of why he is what? In prison. Why is he in prison? This he summed up in verse 20. The reason why he's in prison. He said, for this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. It's the reason why I am in prison, yeah, is because of what? The hope of Israel. I'm bound in this chain because of the hope of Israel. Yeah? Paul was in prison because of the hope of Israel. What is the hope of Israel? What exactly is the hope of Israel? You know, in those days, the children of Israel were under you know, Roman rule. In fact, you can tell because the Jews had no, uh, 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 they didn't have the liberty to deal with Paul himself. They were kind of, uh, if you like, like we understand, colony. They were like colonized by the because the Romans had the superpower at that time. So even in their own land as Jews, their ways and their laws were subject to that of the Romans. So for them, they had a hope. What was their hope? Their hope was that a Messiah will come to deliver them from the control of of the Roman Empire. Do you understand? That they will be free. So it, that was the hope of Israel. It was not just a hope that they put together. It was a hope that was better by prophecy. From their forefathers. When they read 
the laws of Moses and read the prophets and read the scrolls. Just like we are reading the Bible now, there are hopes that we have. So when you refer to the hope of Israel, like today we have the hope of Christianity. One of our hope of Christianity is that there is heaven. One day we will be raptured from this earth to heaven. Is that not, is that not it? It's a general hope that we all hope for. We anticipate. Yes, each individual may have other expectations based on the promises of God. He will heal me. He will prosper me. He will this. But the general hope of Christianity, why we became saved. We didn't become saved because of healing. We didn't become saved because of prosperity. We didn't become saved even because of protection. No, we became saved to escape hell. And to make heaven. So we have our hope is heaven. So at that time, the hope of Israel was for the Messiah. So Paul is now saying to them, listen guys, it is for that hope that I am standing here suffering and that I am here in prison. The common thing that we have all been hoping for. That's why I'm here. Yeah? Well, the Messiah is the hope of Israel. The Messiah is what? The hope of Israel. And he is also our hope today. The Messiah is also our what? Our hope today. Now, the original Greek word of Hebrew origin that is translated Messiah is found in the book of John chapter 1 verse 4. We're going to read that at some point. And John chapter 4, verse 25 in the New Testament literally means the anointed one. The anointed what? One. And when you read through the New Testament, you, see, you hear the word Messiah mentioned in uh, John chapter 1, verse 4. You hear it also mentioned in John chapter 4, verse 25. It means what? The anointed one. One, the anointed one. The anointed one. Let's read John chapter 1, verse 4. John 1, verse 4. The Bible says, In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Yeah? Take me to John chapter 4, verse 25. He said, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will do what? He will tell us all things. Yeah? So that was the hope. That was the hope. Now the problem is the Jews didn't accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So their hope was the same, but when it arrived, they did not accept him as the Messiah because he didn't come in the mode they were expecting. They had, they had a, a preconception of how the Messiah will come. Remember that these guys were people who were already used to warriors leading them. The likes of uh, Saul, for example. When Saul was anointed king, the Bible says he was head and shoulder over everyone. He was, you know, when you see him, you say, yes, this is our king. Then you talk of David. These were men that fought battles and won so many victories. So, 
for them, when they saw this boy, quote unquote, born in a manger, huh? you know, born by a, a small girl by the name Mary, then they are coming to, they do not even have a special place to give birth to him. Was born in the, in the midst of uh, animals. Then he's now growing up. He said, This is the Messiah. They look, okay, who is the father? He's a carpenter. Sabeg, what are you talking about? This is not the Messiah that we have all been waiting for. So you can see why they were not convinced that this is the Messiah. Although he was the Messiah and he is the Messiah. But they couldn't accept it because they had a picture of how the Messiah will arrive. And that's why we have to be very careful not to have preconception about things. Some people have missed great things because of what? Preconception. It must come in so, so, so package. If it's not in so, so package, it will not work. It cannot be. It has made, me, you know, sometimes what God has for you may not come in the package that you have painted. There are ladies who have missed their God-ordained husband. And then later, years later, they'll be looking at the same guy, that guy that came to say hello to them, that they turned away. They will be asking, us, ah, what was wrong with me at that time? Because now, is in the picture that they would have accepted. But you see, by the, when he came, he didn't come in that picture. Because God wanted to bring them into his life before making him that picture. So that he himself will value them and see them as one who contributed to their rise. And not one who just stepped into the finished product. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. You hear some men who tell you that, you know, I can't function without my wife. Uh, you know, what, what I am, my wife, yes. She may not have really done anything, but just as she was there and saw everything unfold. Do you understand? So, these people did not accept. So, I've said, the problem is the Jews didn't accept Jesus. Because he didn't come in the mode they were expecting. The Jews were waiting for a warrior Messiah who would defeat the occupying Roman army and free them from Roman rule as King David had defeated the Philistines and as Moses had led them out of Egypt after God destroyed it. So it was difficult for them. So it took men who had revelations of God or you know whose hearts were open to hear the gospel, to accept. So Paul's telling them, it is for that hope that I'm here. Now, just like the Jews were awaiting a Messiah, yeah, the Samaritans were also awaiting a Messiah. As we see in Jesus' meeting with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Because remember that that woman was not a Jewish woman. She was a Samaritan woman. Yeah, but from the conversation that she had with Jesus, you will see that they were also waiting for what? A Messiah. A Messiah, a deliverer, because everybody was under Roman control. So the Jews were expecting a Messiah. The Samaritans were expecting a Messiah. There were just some differences in the Messiah that they were, they were all expecting. Now the difference is, the Messiah the Jews were awaiting was in some way different from the Messiah that the Samaritans waited for. And let's see the difference. Why the Jews waited for a warrior? Yeah? A warrior. That's what the Jews were expecting. Maybe somebody that just dropped from the sky with a sword in his hand and his head, he just bringing fire. As he's dropping, just cutting people off. They say, yes, everybody will jump out of our messiahs here. Yeah. So while they were expecting a warrior, the Samaritan messiah that they were expecting was 
the deliverer and prophet, one that deliverer and prophet Moses uh, prophesied would be like himself, but not a military leader. Yeah? Like King David. We're going to read Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15 to 18, but let me read the outline before. He said, it is worth noting that the Samaritans believed only the first five books of the Old Testament, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they rejected the rest, including the books that mentioned King David. And you know, David is one of the kings that fought so many battles. So they didn't believe in the books that mentioned David. So it tells you why they were also not really uh, expecting a warrior um, messiah. They, they were expecting a Messiah in the likeness of Moses. And you know the Bible tells us that Moses was one of the meekest men that lived on the face of the earth. So they were expecting a Messiah that would come to deliver them, but he would be what? Milk. He's not going to be, you know, scatter, scatter the ground kind of Messiah. No. Whereas the Jews were expecting that, that kind of Messiah. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's read Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 to 18, and we'll see, you know, it give us some insight to the kind of Messiah that the Samaritans were expecting. So the Lord your God will raise up for you. Now, these were the words of Moses, yeah? He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. So you can see they were expecting a Messiah in the likeness of who? Of Moses, they were hinging on these words. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Verse 16. According to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. Verse 17. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. Now, verse 18. I will raise up for them, yeah, a prophet like what? Like you, from among their brethren. And we put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So, what's the difference? For the uh, Jews, a fighting War front Messiah. For the Samaritan, a Messiah in the form of Moses who would speak. You hear what the, the scripture say? He said, we put my words in his mouth. So one that can, just like Moses stood before Pharaoh and said, okay, let my people go. He will speak to the Romans. Release these people. If he say we will not release them, okay, by tomorrow there will be darkness. So he will fight with his mouth, not with uh, sword. So, that was the kind of Messiah these guys were expecting. So, we know that regardless of what the expectations of the Messiah was, Jesus was the Messiah. Whether the expectations of what the, the, the problem is, the problem is each of them created a limited picture for themselves. Whether it be the Jews or the Samaritans, they created a limited picture for themselves on what mode the Messiah should be. Instead of leaving that picture to God. I don't know if I'm, if I'm talking to somebody. Leaving that picture to who? To God. To say, oh God, you have promised us a Messiah. We are ready. We are open. Send us that Messiah. Sometimes, many of us fall into that same trap. We are expecting something from God. God says he's going to give. Then we start dictating to God how he should come, how he should be. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know? And when it comes, if it does not come in the way we have described, we may end up missing it or disregarding it. And we say, I don't know why God has not answered me. 
Jesus have already answered you. It came, but you could not what? Notice it because you, you have drawn out a list. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. I say, may the Lord help us in Jesus' name. It's like somebody going to God and say, oh God, I want you to prosper me. Yeah? And then God really wants to prosper you. And he brings a business idea. Yeah? But that business idea is not really, you know, it's not something that naturally you enjoy doing. And you know, if people are told, they say, you know, you know, do something that you enjoy doing. Sometimes what you enjoy doing cannot bring you money. What you enjoy doing may not prosper you. That's the truth. There are some businesses you love and you, you will enjoy doing them, but they cannot really prosper you. And God may bring, say, bring you an idea of a business. And because you are looking at what you enjoy doing, you will not feel that this is what God wants you to do. I don't know if I'm making any sense to somebody. So it's, it's very important. You understand that? Or a young lady who is praying for a, a wife. Uh, for a husband, sorry. Praying for a husband. Yeah? He's so tall, dark, this. And then God brings short. Do you understand? To her, she will not feel that this is God. Or even a guy who is praying God to lead him to... The wife's so oh, slim, but God now gives you somebody who is not slim, has a bit of, you know, a bit chubby. Yeah, he said, no, 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 this is not the will of God. It may be the will of God. Don't paint the picture for God. Let his will be what? Done. And that's where they missed it. So regardless of the Messiah, they were all expected. Jesus was the Messiah. And he confirmed this in his conversation with the Samaritan woman. John chapter 4, verse 25 to 26. Let's just read that quickly. The Bible said, the woman said to him, I'm sure you know the story of the Samaritan woman. Jesus was passing through Samaria, met this lady at the well of Samaria, requested for what? Water. The lady said, oh, no, no, no. We uh, Samaritans, we don't give water to, to the Jews. You are not supposed to be drinking with us. What fellowship do we have? Jesus, Jesus said, if you know the person who is asking you for this water, you will not just give cup, you will fetch drum. The woman said, uh -uh, who are you? So, you know, the conversation developed from there. Until Jesus said to her, you know, go and call your husband. And, you know, had the whole conversation. Until they came. Don't, because of the things we need to cover. They came to this point where the lady asked, oh, yeah, I know that we're supposed to worship. They started talking about where they worship. And then Jesus said, you know, I am the Messiah. Let's read that now. 25. The woman said to him, I know that, me I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. Yeah? So this lady even knows, you know the word Christ means the anointed one. So when he comes, he will tell us all things. How do we know that Jesus is the one? Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, I'm what? I'm he. I who speak to you, I'm what? I'm he. I am the Messiah. The one that the Samaritans are waiting for, that the Jews are waiting for, just that all of you, you have confused yourself with your own picture. That even if the picture of the Jews does not match the picture of the Samaritans. But I am the Messiah. So, when Paul was saying to us, what for the hope of Israel, it was it's for this Messiah thing that I'm in this prison. While the Jewish leaders in Rome confirmed they have neither received or heard any negative thing, report about Paul, but they confirmed they have heard negative things about Christianity. Yeah? Because Christianity simply means Christ-like. Those who follow Christ, those who accepted this Messiah. First of all, they have not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Those who also follow him, obviously because they've not accepted Jesus Christ, they see the believers as a sect. These people are like a cult. 
We don't know what they are doing. This new sect that they have formed. My child cannot join this sect. You know that kind of thing. Okay. So, they said, but they confirmed they have heard negative things about Christianity. Acts chapter 28, verse 21 and 22. He said, then they said to him, we neither receive letters from Judah concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. He said, but we desire to hear from you. We want to know whether you belong to this sect or not. We desire to hear from you what you think. For consigning this sect, we know that it is spoken against it where? Everywhere. And that, when I read that, as I was preparing the outline, it was very instructive for me. Something dropped in my spirit. And I find that it is so true. That the devil is not really fighting us. The devil is fighting our faith. Every fight that the devil is launching, it may look like, you may be the one bearing the brunt, it may look like it, but it's not really about you. I don't know if I'm making any sense to somebody. It's not really about you. It's really about your faith. Okay, I think this will help to drive it home. For example, when you think of Ukraine, yeah, the people that have died in the war in Ukraine and the people that are dying, yeah, Putin is not really fighting those Ukrainians, those individuals. He doesn't know them. They don't even know him. They are bearing the brunt for Putin's attack on the move of Ukraine or what Ukraine believes in, what Ukraine believes they are supposed to what do. Okay, leave Ukraine. Go to Gaza. Those Palestinians that are dying, Israel is not really fighting those people. You think it's those people, those children. And that. Is that what Israel is? Re- no. <sighs> but they are bearing the brunt. They are bearing what? The brunt. The people that Israel are really fighting and they really want to wipe out is Hamas. Are you following what I'm saying? In the same vein, the devil's fight is against our faith, against Christianity. Is the attack. So they say, we have not heard anything about you. Paul is not about you, but about this sect. About this sect. About Christianity. And I've said the attack has never been about Paul or you. It has always been about our faith and the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are some of you who are listening to me now. You will discover that truth be told, since you became a Christian, you have more battles to fight. You know why? Because the devil is trying to unsettle you so that you can turn back to where you're coming from. The devil has no business fighting somebody who is already on his way to hell. Do you understand? He already has that one in his bank account. This one is already coming. So the devil also, for lack of words, is doing his own evangelism. Just that the devil does his evangelism through, uh, for lack of word, gra, 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 fight. He's trying, <laughs> he's, he's trying to call, fight people to pull them. So he will attack, he will throw sickness, he will throw this, he will throw that. And this, I, say, ah, I don't know why the devil is fighting me. He's trying to make you turn your back on God. That's what came against, look at Job. That's what the devil was trying to do with Job to the point that his wife now came to his heart. Are you still holding on to this God? Because the wife understands 
that if you, if you reject this God, this thing that is fighting you will leave you. It will just stop. Because the fight is not about you, Job. It's about cutting you off from God. So Job said, ah, why are you speaking like one of these uh, foolish uh, women? So you mean because of this thing I'm going to, I should not cause God. No, no, no. I better die. I better die in this God. So that's what the fight is about. And may we not fail in the name of Jesus Christ. So, although it is you and I that may suffer the brunt of the attack today, like Paul did in his day, because we identify with Christ, we must recognize that it is not really about us. We are called to suffer with Christ so that we can reign with him. A lot of believers don't understand that the call to Christianity is not just a call to pleasure. Do you understand? It is also a call to suffer with Christ. And those who have gone before us, the apostles and fathers of faith, many of them paid price. Not just in the Bible days. Yeah? In the Bible days, there are many who paid a price of suffering. Look at the disciples now who walk with Jesus. John. John, they put John in a pot of oil. Hot oil and put the pot on fire. Boiling it. You know that oil that used to fry plantain or chicken? That's how they put a living human being. Why? Because of his faith. Are you following what I'm saying? A lot of Christians in our generation don't understand that there is a part of suffering in the faith. There is a part of it. Maybe because we don't preach it or preach it enough. There were some that were crucified upside down. Yeah? Because, yeah, they were crucified what? Upside. They crucified them. Can you imagine blood? Blood flowing to their head. And just, they are upside down. Some of them were dealt with like that. All kinds of, you know, suffering for their faith. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 12. We'll read the first from the New King James Version. The Bible says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel. He said, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. He said, therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Verse 11, he said, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Verse 12, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will also, he also will deny us. Let's read it from the NIV. NIV, let's see what NIV says. He said, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. For which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. He said, therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Verse 11 and 12. Here is a trustworthy saying. Listen to it. He said, if we died with him, we will also what? Live with him. Verse 12 now. If we endure, we will also reign with him. But if we disown him, he will also disown us. One translation says, if we suffer with him, we will also what? Reign with him. So all around the world today, there is an opposition against Christianity. And it's, it's so real. And the truth of God's word, there's an opposition against the truth of God's word. This is, this opposition comes from all kinds of places. You have some by governments, by societies using different labels, just because we refuse to what? Align 
with their liberalism agenda. You know, some of the liberalism agenda are anti-scripture, anti-Christian, anti-Bible. And when you see them promoting those anti... Have you seen that they, they try to force it on other religions? No. Is may is Christian church that they try to force it in. I've never heard them trying to force it on uh, other religion. No, they cannot. They will not even mention it because they know that those people will go haywire. They will burn the society down. So, it's an attack against Christianity. So, from government, because we refuse to, they camouflage it with all kind of uh, names. They call it human rights. Sometimes they say it's equal opportunity. Sometimes they say it's inclusion. They just bury those things that under those labels. But we must stand strong in our faith and not allow ourselves to be caught in the compromise. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. Let's read that. The Bible says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will what? Will come. He said, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. He said, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal despisers of good. All these things, are we not seeing them today? He said, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's true. People will be happy to spend six hours in a party. But to spend two hours in church, they say it's too long. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying his power. And from such people, what should we do? Turn away. Verse 6. He said, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins. Led away by various lusts. And verse 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. So the Jews in Paul's day called Christianity a sect. The attack was against the faith. The same is true today. It is basically the manifestation of the proverbial saying, you know, giving a dog a bad name to do what? To hang it. That's literally what it is. Give the dog a bad name to do, to hang it. The Jewish leader's desire, therefore, was not to hear about Paul's travail. They didn't want to even hear what Paul had suffered. They just wanted to hear, you know, this sect. I hope you don't believe in them. What he taught about Christ and Christianity. Let's look at subheading number two. Paul given a day by the Jews to share his thought about Christianity. Now, in the desire of the Jews in Rome to know what Paul thinks of Christianity, they gave him a day to share his views. We read that in verse 23. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Now, knowing that these are a people, you know, because sometimes as human beings, yeah, when you know that somebody is already prejudiced or biased and their thinking pattern is in a certain way, sometimes it affects you in coming straight with your own stand. Is that not true? You... There's, there's this thing in us that makes you almost want, because you see, you don't want to hurt their feeling. You don't want them to feel bad. That makes you almost want to walk a thin line that makes it look like you are tilting towards them a little bit to be able to accommodate them. I don't know if, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So, knowing that these are a people who have already been biased by what they have heard before now, and they have already concluded that Christianity is a sect, would have made some people not stand up boldly to defend the faith, but not Paul. 
And it's the truth. Some people will not. Uh, they say, oh, you don't, uh, let's just leave it. You know, I don't want to talk about it. I, in fact, I want to just face the, the thing that brought me here. I have a case to handle. <laughs> we will talk about it later. Are you, are you, yeah, they can just dismiss it. Because they don't want their view to be known. Because they already know that their view will be contrary to what these people are. So let me, I don't, if I share my view now, I'll make more enemies. I don't, I don't, I'm not here to make, and I've had too many enemies on my way to this place. Let me not come and add more to it now in this new place that I just arrived. <laughs> but not Paul. Not Paul. The apostle Paul is bold when it comes to the gospel. Even if this means him losing friends, yeah? Whether it means him losing friends or losing his life. But once he comes to the gospel, the man is bored. He's not, he's not swimming here and there or diplomatic. He's straight. Exactly. He's, he's, he, 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 he takes his stand and puts it out. So, that was Paul. That was Paul. Yeah, we must become the same and not try to blend into society because you see, society is shifting so much that if we try to blend to society, we will lose our salvation. We will lose our faith. So we must become like Paul. So we don't blend to society or friendship groups by sacrificing what we know of God's word. There's a way we blend, we will sacrifice every knowledge that we know. You say, oh, it doesn't matter. It does, you know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Before you know all kind of compromise, you're accommodating all kind of things that really, as a believer, you should never accommodate. Luke chapter 9, verse 25 to 26. Read a few scriptures now. He said, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or what? Or lost. Think about that. Some people compromise their faith because of friendship. They want to gain people. They want to gain business. They want to, it's a what profit. If he gains the whole world, everybody becomes your friend. You have contact with everybody. You have businesses. You have this but you end up losing your soul. What benefit? So for Paul, if standing for the gospel will mean losing friendship, okay, so let it be. You were not born with the friend the day you were born. You were born alone. Do you understand? And the day you will live here, you will still live by yourself. Do you understand? So, Matthew chapter 19, 27, to 29. Matthew 19, 27 to 29. He said, then Peter answered and said to him, he said, see, we have left all. What did they leave? All. And followed you. If we really want to follow God, there are some things that will leave you. You will lose some things. So that is the truth. To follow God, you will do what? You will lose some things. Peter said, we have left all. Yeah? And what? And followed you. Therefore, let's get the scripture up. He said, we have, loosed, we, have, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Verse 28. So Jesus said to them, I surely I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones. Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 29. He said, and everyone who has left houses. Look at the things they left. When, Paul, when he was saying we've left all. Who have left houses. Left brothers. Left sisters. Left fathers. Left mother. Left wife. Left children. Left lands. For my name's sake. Shall receive a hundredfold. And inherit eternal life. In those days when we were growing up. In Nigeria, when I was a child in like primary school, we used to see sometimes some, some 
uh, young people, maybe a young guy or a young uh, lady, girl, boy, who give their life to Christ, but the family are not Christians. The father we, or mother will drive them away from the house. For what? Giving their life to Christ. And it says either you choose that your Christianity or you choose family. Say, no, I cannot deny Jesus. Right? Some people have really been through that. I've seen. You know, and they will choose Christianity. They have nowhere to stay. Some maybe pastor will accommodate them. Some maybe members will just be squatting. Have nothing. Family have rejected them because of their faith. Jesus said, those who lose father, mother, and all of that. So, we must come to a point where we don't use because of things to deny our faith. I'm a child of God. You are a child of God. We should not have apology for it. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 10, 38 and 39. 38 and 39. Matthew 10. He said, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He said, he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will do what? Will find it. Finally, Matthew 16, 24 to 27. Matthew 16, 24 to 27. He said, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 26. He said, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he will reward each according to his work. So, we can see why Paul, he was not afraid to stand. I know you already see it as he said. I know you are biased. I know you are prejudiced. But this is what I believe. This is the word of God. This is the truth. It was for that day. And he declared it. He declared it. We have no justification, therefore, not to stand firm and promote our faith, Christianity. To the whole world, especially when we consider the price that Jesus paid for us on the cross of Calvary. And it's true. When you think of the price Jesus paid, what price are you and I, are we going to pay now? That is commensurate to that. This weekend we have Easter, and we remind ourselves of the brutal debt that Jesus went through. The price paid on the cross. You know, the the the. The, the thorns upon his head, the spear that came on his side, the weapons on his back. You think of all of those things. What price is too big for us to pay? To stand for our faith should not be too big for us to pay. So when we think of what he did on the cross of Calvary to redeem us from our sins and from hell, Paul took his time to explain about Jesus to them. And persuaded them to believe in Jesus. That's what we must do. That's what we must what? We must do. All our life. But also especially this Easter weekend. That's why we have a Saturday 3 p.m. We are to contact our family members to speak to them about what? Jesus. On Friday, Good Friday, 5 p.m., we have the community come here. We have to show up here in the car park, all of us, to communicate to people about Jesus. If Paul can do it under chains, you and I, we are not under chains. We must do it also. The Lord help us in Jesus' name. So I said, this weekend, when we have to have a personal evangelism on Saturday and also, you know, during the week. Okay. On the appointed day, so they appointed the day, all of them, that they will come for uh, Paul to explain to them, you know, he, what he thinks about this set. So on that appointed day, many people gathered, and Paul used the opportunity to preach to them. The Bible says, from morning till when? Till evening. Now, that indeed was a long service. 
And it is commendable, I have to say, that the people stayed. We have to commend the people. Commend Paul, who preached from morning to evening, and commend the people that did what? That stayed. Because today, many are in a hurry when they come to service and they consider two hours of service to be too long. Yeah? It's true. Ah, sir. No, two hours is too long. It's too long. Yeah? All those are indications of our love for God was in code. When we can see, why did I say that? Because the same person who considers a two-hour service too long, yeah, can be engaged in other things for hours and they will not consider it too long. Can go to a party on Friday evening, birthday party or whatever party, sit down there, yeah, for five hours and not see it too long. So I've said, after how long in a service, and this is for everybody personal examination, after how long in a service, do you start feeling uncomfortable? Or begin to look at your watch and fidget. Compare that with after how long of you watching your favorite sport or TV series or playing a video game before you start fidgeting. Many people will spend much longer in a party without fidgeting than they would do the house of God. It just shows where your heart is. Shows where your heart is. Can you not be like David, who was glad being in God's house? Psalm 122, verse 1 says, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to what? To the house of the Lord. And you discover that churches today are doing everything with music, good ambience, speakers, variety. Don't, that pause this thing. No good ambience. No speaker, no variety of uh, programs. Okay, let's do a print prayer. Uh, if we just do only one thing, they will be tired easily. Okay, after some time, just shift to no. The Bible says it was preaching from morning till evening. It was preaching. No variety. So, okay, do a little bit of praise. Then let somebody give a poem. Then let us have a quiz. At least if you miss it all with variety, then people will be interested. People will be interested. No. Paul, he began to preach from morning to evening. There was an appetite for the word. Yeah? Today's church, even with all of those things, yeah? Good ambience, speakers, variety of programs in the service, etc. To keep the people interested. Yeah? Still, after one hour, <laughs> some people are still tired. They think, ah, when will the service close? When will the service close? Ah, it's getting too long now. And by the time you close, you see, so bad. This, those, they, are not going, they are not rushing anywhere. There's nothing important that they are rushing to do. Is the devil just trying to get them out of the house of God. You discover, you see, when you look at the people who are looking at their time, you would think that they have one, one million pound contract to go and sign somewhere. Nothing like that. By the time you now finish, some of them would hang around. Then some of them would just be talking to people. They say, oh, hey, what, what, what do you have planned? Okay, let's just go. There's one restaurant in there. Uh, Wood green. Let's just go there. They can go to that restaurant and spend the time they did not spend in church. They can stay there till four, five. They will not get tired. They say, oh, I was in this. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was fine, you know. After church, we just went and we were just relaxed. Before we knew, time was gone. May God forgive you, your iniquity. <laughs> he says, behold, it was gone. 
In fact, when we came, I was surprised. Everywhere was already dark. So we just got on, just fell on our bed and slept and woke up the following morning. <laughs> oh my God. You know, God is good. Thank God that God is not a man. Honestly, if God was a man, ah, all of us would have suffered. <laughs> I'm telling you. So, it's very important. The question is, do you not start feeling a message is too long when it's up to or above an hour? What's wrong with this generation? May we not lose our hunger for God. May we not lose our hunger for his word in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. All right, let's take our discussion questions for tonight. We have three of them. First one, who is the Messiah? And how do we know that Jesus is the one? Yeah? Do you have any scripture to back your answer? So that's question number one. Who is the Messiah? How do we know that Jesus is the one? And do you have any scripture reference? Whether ones that we refer to or some that you also know uh, that we may not have referred to to back up your answer. So that's question number one. And those of you who are online, please feel free to also send us your comment. The Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. In the book of Isaiah, um, uh, uh, prophet Isaiah prophesied that a virgin Mary will give birth to, uh, to the Son of God. In Isaiah 7, 14. Thank you. Also, the other question is, uh, the answer is, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. In John 4, 26, Jesus himself, for the first time in the Gospel of John, as, uh, he, he named himself as the Messiah. He reveals it directly to a woman at the well in Samaria. His exact word to the woman was, I, the one speaking to you, I am he, which means he's the Messiah. Oh, Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah? And you've made reference to two Bible uh, passages as, you know, the evidence of him being the Messiah. Anyone wants to add? Yes, that? praise God. Hallelujah. Yes, in that John 4, 25, she quoted where the woman said the Messiah is coming. And that came to, the, they referred to the Messiah as the Christ. <laughs> in uh, Mark 4, Mark 14, when Jesus was arraigned before the high priest, Tyre Pat, um, he asked him, are you the Christ? You know, in, 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 in John 4, 25, we know that the Messiah is the Christ. Yeah, but yeah. There he asked him, are you the Christ? That is the Messiah. Mm. He said, I am. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, we see from the evidence in those passages of scripture that Jesus is the Messiah. All right, we've got on uh, Facebook, uh, Joseph Akelemon said, Jesus is the Messiah. And his scriptural reference is Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 to 20. God bless you for that contribution. Then also we've got Sister Terma, who have said, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. She said, Jesus confirmed he is the Messiah in John chapter 4, verse 26. All right, great. We take those answers. Okay. Those are correct. We'll go to question number two. What does the fact that although the Jews in Rome have not heard anything negative about Paul, but have heard negative things about Christianity, what does that tell us? They've not heard anything negative about Paul, but they have heard negative things yeah, about Christianity. What does that tell us? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. The Jews could not pinpoint any negative thing against Paul. Yeah. So they felt that if they incarcerate Paul, who is so strong in championing the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
which the wicked and evil ones tempt as a sect, they will succeed in stopping the spread of the gospel, which is spreading so fast. Mm. The leaders were afraid what this could cause to them. So they tried to um, make sure that um, they stop Paul from, uh, from, sp- from spreading the gospel. Okay. So they labeled, they labeled it a sect, yeah, with an intention of stopping Paul uh, from spreading the gospel. Okay, I'll take that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm more concerned about the fact that, one, there is no negative report about Paul. But there is a negative report about Christianity. I, I don't know if, if you understand me. Yeah. And really, you know, what, what does that tell us that the enemy is up to? But before we do that, let me read some answers that came online for question number one. Okay, so uh, Edgeware Center, they said, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus revealed it in many places. Woman at the well, John chapter 4, verse 25 or 26. They've got there, I think it's 25. And then Jesus also revealed it to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Okay, then they said to question number two, that it tells us, that's Edgeware, it tells us attacks have never been on individuals, but the attack has always been against Christianity. Okay? Uh, you want to add to yeah. that? Praise God. Hallelujah. What came to my mind here is um, yeah. they've not had any negative thing about Paul, but of Christian, of the sect. Yeah. And I'm just asking myself, how do they hear negative things about Christianity? Mm. Um, we were told, you know, different places Paul preached. Yeah. They were talking negative things about, you know, the sect, which is Christianity, yeah. and the leaders of the Jews, they heard about this. Yeah. So come to what is happening today. Um, we hear about, if we look at the social media today, the, the negative things we hear about Christianity is what even the believers themselves, those who have heard about Christianity, who are involved in Christianity, they are the ones that are even spreading the negative things. Yeah. And we must understand that it is one of the devices of the enemy yeah. to weaken the faith. That's it. Like you said, is the faith the um, the enemy is attacking. Yeah. So when believers are hearing too many negative things about Christianity, yeah. their faith is being weakened. That's true. Praise God. Hallelujah. And a lot of people also ignorantly, yeah, join the bad wagon of spreading. Yes, those negative uh, information. And I've, I've never known or seen a fit. Yeah? Yes, like I've never seen Hindus spreading negative things about Hinduism, Muslims publishing on uh, social media negative things about Islam or uh, what you call it, Sikh publishing negative things about No, no, no. But you will see Christians themselves carry things, negative news about church and be spreading it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's all the trick of the devil to weaken Christianity, to break it, to attack it, to kill it. And may we not be part of the instrument that the devil uses to accomplish his, <laughs> to do his mission in the name of Jesus Christ. So the attack is always about the faith. About the faith. Okay, final question. Why? Did, okay, this should be why didn't Paul change his message? Yeah? Why didn't Paul change his message even though he knows the Jews in Rome already have a bias against Christianity? And what can we learn from the duration of how long the people stayed to listen to Paul? So it's a two a questions in one. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Paul 
is someone who stands for a uh, stand his ground when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. He had an encounter directly with Jesus Christ when he was going to persecute the Christians. Yeah. He knew the suffering Jesus went through for us humans. Jesus died for him, so he, so he was ready to die for Jesus Christ as well. Mm. He was working his own salvation with fear and trembling yeah. to gain the crown of life. Mm. I then, like that answer. Then the other part is, uh, is this. Uh, we should uh, the uh, way, uh, the duration of the uh, of the Jews um, uh, spending time with Paul uh, while he was giving lecture to them for money tonight shows that they were very uh, 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 eager yeah. to know the uh, to know exactly uh, what uh, Paul was trying to tell them about the Messiah Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, and these days, uh, like how, like what you said before, yeah. Uh, most of us, we are not. Uh, we don't. We don't want to spend so much time to hear the word of God. We look at our time. We want to rush home to do this and that or go somewhere else. Like uh, sometimes I have an encounter with some people. Like when I invite them to church, then they say, "Okay, what time does the church start?" I tell them, "Okay, we start by ten o'clock and we close uh, this time." They say, "Oh, two hours or uh, two and a half hours is too much." Then I tell them, "Listen to me." We have 24 days in one uh, in a day. Mm. Then, uh, when you time it by one week, that is um, uh, uh, 168 hours. Yeah. I said that we are giving God for that one week only two hours. Mm. So, uh, is that not enough? Don't you? Uh, is 166 hours yeah, not girl. enough for you to do whatever you, you want know? to yeah, do? Yeah. So sometimes yeah. it just baffles me yeah. when I tell them that it's oh, okay, okay, okay. It's, it's all right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. it's true. Two hours for some people in a week, and like you said, in 168 hours, two hours in a week service for some people is too much. The Lord help us in Jesus' name. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, Paul did not change his message, even though he knew the, the Jews already had bad against Christianity. Yeah. Because one, he was very focused. Mm. And he knew he, he knew the crown that was waiting, that was awaiting him. Yeah. Because he even said, I fought a good fight. Mm. And he, he knew that to die with Christ was gain. Yeah. And that if you die for Christ, you are going to live with Christ. And he was so determined that that eternal life, that glory with Christ, he will get it. Yeah. And he was just trying to show example to the Jews. Amen. And um, what can we learn about the duration, like my sister Grace has said, and it's because most people, they are lovers, according to the Bible, they are lovers in this end time we are now. Yeah. People are lovers of pleasure mm. more than lovers of God. Yeah. So the things of the world, they take more interest in them. Mm. They, they, like, let's say people going to watch football match, they can spend hours. hours yeah. They can travel long distance yeah. to go and watch a match, travel even to one country and the other from morning to night because this area where we live, there is a football stadium. When when a when football match is going to start by four in the evening, yeah. people are already by twelve, by somewhere. twelve or yeah. even 10. ten. They are finding their way there. They are not going to live yeah. there in time. No. And when they finish, they are going to the poor. But before they go, they go. So they may spend even twelve hours for a man that is going to be like ninety minutes. Yeah. So people prefer those pleasures of life more than you know being lovers of God. Mm. I think that is the problem of today. But we pray that believers will not, you know, will not conform in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, Edward Center said, his message cannot be changed as he was not concerned about pleasing them or eye service, but was more concerned about telling the truth so that he can win some and correct their negative views. And that's, and that's so true. That's so true. And may God help us to be able to stand for our faith in every situation in the name of Jesus Christ. We're going to make these declarations together as we wrap up this evening. Say with me, O oh Lord, stir up in me a hunger and passion 
for you, for your word, and for spreading the gospel that nothing else can quench that hunger. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to take our offerings this evening before we close. There are four ways by which you can give. There's the online uh, giving link that will be shared in the comment section on Facebook and also on YouTube. If you click on it, it would be able to take you to the page where you can process your giving. Then you have, of course, the direct banking where you can um, give through direct bank transfer. The account name is Faith Miracle Church. Sort code is 089299. Account number is 6562 As you give this evening, may the Lord's blessings flow for you. Uh, we can give our tithes as well tonight. You have your tithe. Feel free to give it this evening. Your offering as well. Uh, feel free to give. And God's blessings be upon you in the name of Jesus Christ. We also have the PayPal giving details. PayPal giving details is info at fitmiraclecenter.uk. Info at faithmiraclecenter.uk and then you have the telephone given which is 0772 uh, please check on your uh, Facebook giving uh, Facebook the comment session and you should have the giving link or share there God bless you and YouTube let's lift up our offerings to the Lord and our tithes as well for those of you who are giving your tithes today and we'll pray over it. Father in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the provision that comes from you alone. We are grateful that we are called your sons and your daughters, that we are believers and that we are able to give. So we give today our offerings, we give our tithes, we ask that you will bless us. Let the heavens over us be open. Pour out a blessing that we have room not enough to accommodate. In Jesus' most precious name, amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Just some quick notices. Tomorrow morning, we will be live on this YouTube and Facebook platforms uh, for the Anzam Prevail Prophetic Prayer by 6 a.m. Then, of course, we have... Uh, tomorrow evening, talk with the missus by 7 p.m. So join us for talk with the missus by tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. On Friday, very important announcement, 5 p.m. We are here for our corporate outreach. We have a number of people becoming homeless, needy people. We want to share with them materials, food, a clothing and all of that, but also share the gospel with us. So we need all of you here by 5 p.m. Then following that, that same Friday, by 7 p.m., we come into the sanctuary for a night of worship, and the presence of God will be so real here. So don't miss it for anything in the world. On Saturday by 3 p.m., you will be calling your family members, your friends, your colleagues, those who don't know Jesus, like Paul, you will share the gospel with them. And then, of course, on Sunday by 10 a.m., we'll be here for Sunday service. The Lord bless you. The Lord establish his covenant in your life and cause his glory to be revealed in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise to our feet and make these declarations with me before we share the goodness. Say in the name of Jesus, I declare I am covered with the blood of Jesus. Say, I declare no weapon formed or fashioned against me will be able to prosper. I declare in the name of Jesus, with long life, the Lord God is satisfying me. With my eyes, I will see the reward of the wicked. I am blessed. 
I am preserved. I am healed from all the afflictions of the wicked one. In Jesus' name, amen. Together we say surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. We should dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed.